Hi, Dr. Rebecca Borup here to talk to you about sensory input and motor reflexes. I want to begin with a brief um, comment on the sensory nervous system. Most of us grew up hearing that we have five special five senses: vision, hearing, smell, taste and touch. Today we're going to be learning about these senses and we're going to learn that we actually have quite a bit more than just five. These first four that I listed are part of what we call our special senses. We need to add to this list the sense of equilibrium. of being able to maintain our balance. We, we need our sensory nervous system for that, specifically to detect how our head is positioned in relationship to the rest of our body and to our environment. Touch alone actually includes numerous different types of senses that all can be grouped under touch. And we also have a tremendous number of senses that are dedicated to monitoring homeostasis. or I should say helping us maintain homeostasis. Things like receptors that detect oxygen levels, carbon dioxide levels, glucose levels. We have sensors, sensory neurons that detect blood pressure. Uh, they attack, detect um, hydrogen ion levels in the blood, so blood pH osmolarity and so on. I could could write a long list of the things that we measure thanks to our sensory nervous system. The sensory nervous system is the system or the, the nervous system branch that is responsible for collecting information and sending that information to our central nervous system. It is this afferent branch of the nervous system. Afferent meaning to arrive, or I, I like to think of it as arriving. I tend to think of a train, an arriving train that's arriving at our destination. And our destination is that central nervous system, which contains the brain and the spinal cord, which includes those two structures. This, the central nervous system is our integrating center, which means it receives the information and determines from that information what type of output or response is appropriate. The central nervous system collects the sensory information and then sends information out on a system that is not part of the sensory nervous system, the efferent branch of the, of the nervous system. Our efferent branch includes what we call our motor neurons, And of the motor neurons, we can further divide that into our somatic motor neurons, which control the skeletal muscle, and our autonomic motor neurons, which control the involuntary processes such as um, heart rate, digestive function, and so forth. The afferent incoming information from the sensory nervous system, integration by the central nervous system, and outgoing information through the efferent nervous system all make up a neuronal circuit. Okay. And these, this type of pattern is often seen in reflex pathways involving either the spinal cord or in some cases the brain stem or even the brain. A reflex typically refers to something that is not consciously perceived. And I want to make note of that, that a significant percentage of our sensory information that is being sent to the central nervous system is not perceived. 
which means we have no conscious awareness of this at all. It all is under our subconscious. If you think of osmolarity, for example, if I were to ask you, what is your blood osmolarity right now? You wouldn't be able to tell me. You could give me a guess. Well, I'm healthy, so it's probably within a standard range of 270 milli osmoles to maybe 310 milli osmoles, somewhere in that range. But you can't give me an exact number because you don't know it. It's not part of your conscious awareness. Nevertheless, your central nervous system is still monitoring that. And it monitors it carefully because if your blood osmolarity is too high, the brain needs to stimulate a behavior such as getting a glass of water to drink to dilute some of that those osmoles in your blood or it needs to signal the kidneys to get rid of more sodium or um, so on okay so it needs to respond to maintain homeostasis and so that's an important thing to understand. We so often are conditioned to think of the sensory nervous system in a very limited fashion, but it's not at all limited. And a lot of what's going on, a lot of the information carried to the spinal cord is, is not part of our conscious awareness. Sensory nervous system cells called receptor cells, they're neurons. Okay, these would be neurons, but they're usually specialized neurons. And we'll talk about some of those specializations. Okay. But they're specialized to detect a stimuli and to respond to that stimuli. And the way that typically works is they have, if I were to diagram, for example, if this pink line right here is the membrane of a neuron, well, contained within that neuron would be specialized receptors designed to detect a stimulus of some sort. And when that stimulus would interact with that receptor, it would cause a change in the neuron that the neuron can read. And this chemical, this signal, not always chemical, the signal would then be transmitted through electrical signals that can be propagated from one neuron to another. Sensory receptors uh, can further be subdivided into what we call internal receptors. These are the ones that monitor internal conditions. So like the receptors that monitor osmolarity as one example. And the external receptors, these are the ones that monitor your external environment. So these are going to be detecting things like heat, um, pressure, etc. That touch that you hear about light from the from the uh, environment sound waves all of those would be external reception receptors now these specialized cells can take a variety of different forms the two perhaps most common types are illustrated here and one of these types of cells we actually have free nerve endings, dendrites, I should say, that are exposed to the environment. This increases the sensitivity of the neuron, and these nerve endings are often there to, to detect stimuli. Um, for example, pain okay, might be detected by specialized receptors in these free nerve endings. I want you to notice the structure of this neuron. In particular, I want you to see that the cell body is here and that the axon actually starts right here. This is different from what we might call the classical configuration in which you have our dendrites. Something like this our cell body, and then our axon. Recall in this classical uh, formation that we begin our signaling process in the neuron with graded potentials that are formed in the dendrites or perhaps the cell body. And those graded potentials spread to the axon hillock 
before we'll actually end up with, say, an action potential that then can propagate down the axon. The cell body, in this case, acts as the integrating center and determines whether or not we're going to get an action potential by summing, and you'll recall we talked about spatial and temporal summation in class, but by summing, let's say our ISEP, ISP, so we'll say the blue one is my ISP. Let's try that again. IPSP inhibitory postsynaptic potential, and we'll say that my orange one over here is my excitatory postsynaptic potential. And whether or not we get an action potential determines, de depends on whether or not we reach that magic threshold of minus 55 millivolts in the axon hillock. Now let's go back to our sensory neuron. In our sensory neuron, we have the axon hillock right here. And uh, that's rather interesting because that means the graded potential that is going to perhaps stimulate an action potential doesn't have to travel all the way through the cell body. It doesn't have to travel all that far at all to reach that axon hillock. And if it reaches that axon hillock with a depolarizing stimuli equal to minus 55 millivolts, then we end up with an action potential that is propagated and because this is a myelinated neuron, it will be propagated from the axon hillock to each node of Ranvier, very rapidly being transmitted down the axon to those nerve terminals, and then it will synapse onto typically another neuron, um, which communicates our signal. It doesn't have to go through this reservoir of cell body that you normally have to go through in a typical neuron because the cell body is right here out of the way. And so it doesn't absorb or dilute the graded potential at all. It's, it's simply out of the way. It's, just, it's not going to factor into the generation of the action potential. This makes sensory receptors more likely to generate action potentials to carry the information to the, the central nervous system. Now I do want to specify that sensory neurons can be unmyelinated or myelinated. So even though we're seeing here an example of a myelinated neuron, it's also possible to have a sensory receptor that is, um, a sensory receptor cell, I should say, that is unmyelinated. Before we go on, I do need to clarify some terminology. We are very used to thinking of receptors as being proteins. And certainly that is part of, that's one meaning for the word. But when we're dealing with the sensory nervous system, you have to look at context. Because I could say a receptor and mean a protein, but I also could say a receptor and mean an entire cell. This whole neuron is a sensory neuron, of course, that's one word for it, but it's also a sensory receptor sensory receptor cell, or for short, a sensory receptor, or just a receptor. So make sure you're comfortable with the meaning of the word and looking at context in terms of what I'm actually talking about. And what other physiologists would be talking about, or sensory experts, um, the terminology can be a little tricky. While I'm on that, I want to talk about this threshold potential. Um, we're going to hear words, and I'll see them a little bit later. We're going to hear things like 
this one generator potential which in sensory nervous system is the same thing as the threshold potential it just has a different name Going back to my neurons and looking at my neurons, the second neuron down here, this slightly more complex neuron, has my free nerve endings. Let me go ahead and kind of draw them back in. They're in there, and if you look at it, you can see them. They're still there, but they're encapsulated by uh, connective tissue, and that connective tissue protects those free nerve endings. Free nerve endings are frequently damaged or can be damaged easily I should say and so you commonly will see these types of receptors um, the capsulated re encapsulated receptors are found throughout the skin the epidermis for example um, and detect things like pressure and so forth then the last type of receptor I want to talk about is the multicellular receptor we see these a lot in the special special senses for example, shown here, we actually have two different types of multicellular receptors. This first part on the top is the rod for one of our uh, photoreceptors in our eyes. You may have heard of rods and cones. Rods specialized in detecting light during low light settings, but they can't see color. They don't detect color. This is one of the reasons at night, when it's twilight, we can often have a hard time telling what color something is. Browns and blues will look black to us, um, and so forth. But this rod, this is this part here, this first part, is not a, a neuron. It's a specialized cell, but it's not a neuron. The neuron is right here. But if you notice this structure here, that should look to you an awful lot like a synapse. And that's because it is. It's a synapse between a non-neuronal cell and a neuron. Okay. Now it's this photoreceptor, it's the rod that actually detects the light and is affected by light. So a photon of light will strike that cone and it will cause a change within the cone and then ultimately the cone has synaptic vesicles, a lot like a neuron, even though it's not a neuron, that will dump neurotransmitter into the synapse that will then activate the neuron creating a graded potential which will hopefully trigger an action potential in uh, the neuron and carry that information to the brain. The second group below is actually found in our tongues and that's the the taste buds, the taste cells. So this portion right here is our classic taste bud portion where only a little bit of this is exposed but each of these taste buds specialize in detecting certain types of chemicals. For example, taste buds that detect salt will detect the chemical sodium ion. And what that ends up doing is activating these green cells. These green cells are the non-neuronal cell. But it's a specialized receptor cell. And that specialized receptor cell will detect the, the sodium and will trigger the release of neurotransmitter onto these dendrites for the neurons. Activating those neurons, creating the graded potential, which then remember because my axon hillock is right there close to the dendrites, right? Right there then we're most likely to get an action potential that carries and propagates that information and that information is propagated down the axon to the brain. And so we can detect the, t the taste for salt in this way or perhaps glucose or, or whatever this taste bud specializes in. We see these types of multicellular receptors throughout uh, the special senses. Okay, so in 
um, the ears, for example, we actually have these little hair cells. And they're not neurons either, but they synapse onto a neuron like so. And so when a sound wave strikes the hair cells, it causes those hairs to wave, which then generates a signal inside the cell and we release neurotransmitters and so forth. And so that's essentially the pattern that is followed um, by these specialized multicellular uh, sensory complexes. In the sensory nervous system, we also have what is called accessory structures. Now, accessory structures, importantly, are not receptors. Okay, they're not receptor cells. They're neither neurons nor specialized receptor cells like rods and cones. But they are structures designed to support sensory function. A good example is the eye. The rods and cones are back here in the retina. So they'd be back here, my rods, my cones, back here. And the nerves that detect those, or the neurons that detect those, would be running through this optic nerve. Remember, the nerve is a bundle of nerves, uh, neurons. And so it's back here. This is where my specialized receptor cells are. This is where my optic nerve is. That's the only part of the eye that can be classified as sensory receptors. Everything else is part of an accessory structure. The iris designed to change pupil diameter. The lens which refracts light. The cornea, okay, it's protecting the light. The vit vitreous humor. All of the muscles, etc. These are all part of this accessory structure, this complex structure that helps to direct the light where it needs to go. So it activates those rods and cones at the back. Now, they don't always have to be as complex as the eye. On the right, we actually see a hair. You look at your arm, you have tons of little arm hairs sticking out. And you know, if you're like me, you might have wondered why on earth do we even have hairs? We're not like a bear that needs our fur coat to keep warm. We just have these residual hairs, you know, are they just leftovers, vestibular um, leftovers from when we were hairy? Or do they have a function? And the answer is they have a function. The shaft of the hair, this part right here, is wrapped up by free nerve endings. You can see them here. These are our free nerve endings wrapped around the shaft of the hair. Notice also that we have this muscle here which is there to cause piloerection. Piloerection. This is what gives you your goosebumps. If this, if we were a cat or a dog, this would be what would cause our hair to stand on end as we uh, hiss or, or growl or whatnot. We also have, of course, the gland here to secrete sweat or oil, but I'm not worried about that. What I want you to see is this nerve ending here, and the purpose of it is that is when something brushes this hair. So let's just say we're going to have a little spider. Yeah, don't laugh at my spider, okay. Little spider guy is going to crawl along my arm and he's too light to trigger any of my other senses. But if he brushes that hair, I'm going to feel him because it causes the hair to move and tugs on these nerve endings. So the hair and its uh, follicle are accessory structures. And so I can brush the spider off or squish it, whatever I want to do. Ear also would be special sense, or uh, sorry, would also be an accessory structure. Allows the sound waves in through the canal, hits the eardrum, definitely an accessory structure here. The incus, malus, and stapes, accessory structures, um, and so forth. The hair cells are found in the cochlea 
There's also hair cells in the semicircular canals. The semicircular canals are for equilibrium. And I hope you know that from your anatomy class. I'm not going to get into it too much, but I want to make sure you know and understand these are the structures that are devoted to the special senses, your nasal cavity, your eye, of course, um, tongue, and so forth. All of them are part of these special senses. I do want you to know, so commit to memory what the special senses are. Olfaction is smell, optic is vision, auditory sound, equilibrium balanced, and gutation is taste. Now, you've been introduced to these cranial nerves in your anatomy class. I don't expect you, if you've forgotten them, and you probably have, because I certainly have, like memorized them and then forgotten them probably, I don't know, countless times. Um, don't stress about having to memorize them. But what I want to note here is um, that these nerves exit the, or exit or enter into the central nervous system. And so these are actually part of the peripheral nervous system and they're part of the sensory nervous system, carrying information to the brain or they're part of the um, efferent nervous system carrying information away. Generally, because they are nerves, they're bundles of neurons. Inside the nerves, you will have axons going, traveling uh, in both directions. Now, action potentials are going to be generated. That's actually what's being transmitted. You already know that, though, so that's kind of a reminding you of something that you already have programmed into your head. Each of these neurons specialize in a, in a specific sense, okay? And that's important to understand. Your even taste, for example, you taste because you have specialized taste buds that detect sodium and completely different taste buds that detect glucose and completely different taste buds that detect hydrogen ions, things that are sour, and completely different taste buds that detect glutamate, monosodium glutamate. This is the Unami receptors you may have heard about, and so on and so forth. But a sodium detecting taste bud cannot detect glucose, and a sodium de or a glucose detecting taste bud does not detect glutamate. They're specialized. And that's actually very important to how the, the nervous system, the sensory nervous system works. Each of these specialized cells send their information um, to higher regions within the brain where this information can be processed and integrated. If we take a look at the figure here, okay, I want you to notice just in general where some of these, this information travels. The information from the taste, for example, goes first to the brain stem, which can help modify your behavior, and then ultimately to this gustatory center right there. The information for the nose goes to our effect olfactory center right there. The eye, don't forget we have the optic chiasma, so the information will actually cross over. So the eye on the left actually communicates with the um, vision centers in the uh, on the right side of the brain and the eye on the right communicates with the vision centers on the left side of the brain. They pass through, all of these pass through the thalamus, which is this region shown here in yellow. Okay, this region here, let me, let me circle it so you can see it a little better. I'll circle it in green. Okay, this is the thalamus. And the thalamus is often thought to process, um, well, it helps to process emotions. It's not the only place that does. Um, but it is a good relay station for a lot of different information. And you can see that even, for example, equilibrium goes through the thalamus. The only thing that doesn't is the nose, the olfactory system. And so we have an auditory cortex, 
right here, a um, gustatory cortex, an olfactory cortex, a visual cortex, also in the occipital lobe, um, and so forth. And so we have different segments of the, of the brain that are dedicated to each of these different specialized senses. <clears throat> In order for something to be perceived, it has to make it to the correct cortex, the correct region, at which point it is processed and our brain seeks to understand it. Light, for example, is just photons of light. Our eyes have no understanding of what these photons mean. It's just collecting different colors at any given time. But as the information is carried first to our visual cortex and then from the visual cortex to other areas of the brain, we can begin to associate those wavelengths of light with an item that we can see. So I'm staring at my computer, so I, I see my computer in front of me. I know what the item is. I recognize the shape and the structure of it, and I can apply to an, a name to it and a meaning to it, and I know its function. All of that involves the central processing that is involved to take the sensory information and turn it into something meaningful. The Here's a little bit of a closer look. I want to talk about somatic sensors. So up here we're talking about specialized senses. Vision, um, olfaction, gutation, etc. But notice this right here. Notice this one. Let's pick a different color. Purple, I guess, sounds good. You see that one? It comes up here to this purple region right here. Those are our somatic senses. When you see the word somatic, you should think body. Body. These are the senses that are found elsewhere. They're not the specialized senses. But they are, they do include sensory neurons in your face that detect touch, muscle movement, etc. And sensory neurons in your skin that detect touch, pressure, heat, etc. Sensory neurons found in your skeletal muscle that detect um, something called proprioception, which is the relationship or, or where that muscle is in relationship to other structures of the body, how much it's, it's stretched, how much tension is present in that muscle, um, to also include the sensory receptors in your digestive system that tell you that your stomach has stretched out because it's full of food or that your intestines are a little bit gurgly because you've got some gas bubbles in there. Those are all things that are detected by these somatic senses. And those somatic senses carry that information to what is known as the somatosensory cortex in the brain. And that's this structure here that's outlined in blue that I'm now coloring in purple. The information has to travel through this, the thalamus, which is our, our pretty much all-encompassing relay station. And in this somatosensory cortex, we process that information and we determine from the information that is being sent whether it deserves conscious attention, do we need to pay attention to it? Conscious perception, right? Um, how important is this? Whether it can stay in our subconscious and we can just act upon that sensation even though it's not reaching our conscious awareness. Um, for something to be consciously perceived, it's got to make it to the cerebral cortex, which does include the somatosensory cortex. Um, and that somatosensory cortex also communicates closely with the motor cortex, not shown here, that didn't show up very nicely, but that is closely linked both in proximity and function to the somatosensory cortex. And so there can be communication between those systems so that what we see, or sorry, so that what we feel can be acted upon appropriately as we integrate the signal. Now, what somatic senses do we have? Well, we certainly have more than five. Or certainly have more than touch. We can have um, somatic senses that, dis 
detect mechanical injury. Sorry, mechanical injury. Try that again. Mechanical energy, which could sometimes be causing injury, but most of the time this is very light touch, uh, a little bit stronger touch, so compression, pressure, vibration, stretch, etc. Okay, these are what we usually associate when we talk about touch as being a sense. We're usually talking about sensory receptors that can detect this mechanical energy. Okay, thermal energy is detecting heat. Now the absence of heat energy is cold. So these thermal recept re receptors measure both, but they measured essentially in the absence of heat being interpreted as cold or, or activating certain receptors. So some of these receptors are activated by the absence of heat and some of these receptors are activated by heat if that makes sense. And then we've got our chemical energy, or, sorry, our chemical receptors, chemoreceptors, we'll get into the names in just a second, that detect small chemicals, ions, hydrogen ion for acidity, okay, carbon dioxide. By the way, carbon dioxide is converted into hydrogen ion uh, and let me give you that equation really quick. CO2 plus H2O can be converted into hydrogen ion plus this bicarbonate ion. We'll see that equation come up later, but my point is that CO2 and hydrogen ion are closely related. So when you're detecting acidity in the blood, you're also detecting CO2. We'll, we'll discuss that later, at a later date. But oxygen, fatty acids, amino acids, glucose, etc., all detected. These are all chemical chemicals that are being detected by these receptors. Now, pain is funny. Pain can actually be caused by any of these. You may not have thought about it, but if you, you do take a second you think about it, it's very easy for pressure to become too much. And so you go from, a, you know, a hard, firm, somebody grabs your arm and it's a firm grip, okay? And then they squeeze a little too hard and suddenly that firm grip becomes painful. Um, you get into a hot bath and it, it feels nice, but if it's a little bit too hot, instead it feels painful. Cold, maybe you haven't experienced this, um, in California, but I grew up in Colorado and I, the cold, you know, you put your hand on a, in the middle of winter on some metal and it feels like it's burning, it hurts. And so these all, and of course acid um, can cause essentially chemical burns. These all would contribute to pain. Pain is caused by anything that might cause damage. It either does cause damage or it might cause damage, okay? One of the two things. And it's our signal, our emergency signal to try to avoid any further injury. So the may cause damage, you twist your ankle a little bit but nothing actually was done. It causes you shift your, to shift your weight so that you don't sprain your ankle, you just kind of twist it a little bit um, and so forth. Now each of these receptors have a name. Receptors that detect mechanical energy are called mechanoreceptors. And they fit into three basic categories. One is called proprioceptors for proprioception. These are a little hard to describe, but these are testing, are measuring at any given time your position as it relates to other objects around you, as it relates to yourself, so you know generally speaking, the position of your arm, even if you're not touching anything. Um, it also detects tension in the muscles or stretch. 
okay? These are all part of proprioception. And proprioceptors are actually quite interesting in that you actually can use memory of your awareness with your relationship to other objects to navigate your environment. For example, in the middle of the night, I have a lot of practice with this because I tend to stay up later than my husband. If I'm going in to get ready for bed, I know how to navigate my bedroom without the lights on. And it's because um, I have this spatial memory and then proprioception. So my spatial memory tells me this is where the bed is, this is where my dresser is, the dogs are always laying in this particular spot, so I need to step over the dog. Um, and it tells me those things because I've got that visual spatial memory, but proprioception tells me where my feet are and where my hands are and so forth. And so I know, you know, how big of a step to make without necessarily having to count, okay, it's 10 steps to the bed. You can do all sorts of fun things with proprioception. You can write your name with your eyes closed. Um, those types of things are due to proprioception. Your awareness of where your hand is in relationship to other objects and to itself and to the body. Baroreceptors detect pressure. Now sometimes that pressure can also manifest in terms of stretch. Specifically the stretch of, say, an artery. But really, stretch is about pressure too. So if an artery is, say, this big, and the blood is pushing against the walls of that artery, it might cause that artery to stretch out to, say, this big. And the baroreceptors would detect the force that causes that artery to stretch. And then tactile. These are what most people think about when they think about touch. Okay. These are things like finger touch, pressure, etc. Proprioception is due to receptors, specialized receptors, um, found in the joints and muscles. Okay. Such as the muscle spindle, which we'll be talking about later in a reflex here. But it's found, if we were to look at skeletal muscles, so here's some skeletal muscle fibers. Let's say the muscle fin spindle are specialized receptors that are san sandwiched in between these muscles. And as the muscles grow tight, they put pressure on those capsules, those spindles, and that generates an action potential that is sent to the central nervous system. We find barrel receptors in blood vessels, um, the digestive system, the respiratory system, the urinary tract. You can actually, um, it's not like you can see it, but you can, barrel receptors, you can notice them, I guess, in action by just breathing deeply. The barrel receptors are what tells you that your chest has expanded. You can feel the pressure of the air in your thoracic cavity, and your brain is aware of that because of these barrel receptors. Okay. Your tactical receptors are typically found in the skin or sometimes in the tissue below the skin, the connective tissue. This figure shows an example of several different types of receptors that we find in the skin. Now, I'm not going to ask you for the names. I'm going to show you the names, but I'm not going to ask you for the names. But I want you to notice, we'll start with these. These are the free nerve endings, and you'll notice that some of those free nerve endings are found just kind of poking up through the skin. And so this is what's going to detect light pressure and um, maybe injury. We also have the free nerve endings wrapped around the hair follicles, as shown here. Then we start to get a little bit more complicated as we go deeper into the levels of the skin, deeper into the dermis layer, the epidermis, we'll have these little tiny capsulated neurons here. You can see them right here as you zoom in on them, shown here. Deeper still, um, we're going to find some of these others 
For example, the bulbous corpus is quite deep into the layer of skin. Um, in fact, it's uh, down near the most, near the lowest levels, and you can see it right here, and that's going to detect deep pressure. You've got some of these other ones shown here. Notice this is my cap encapsulated neuron. This is the dendrite right here. Okay. And we've got layers of collagen fibers protecting that. Here we've got another one a little bit higher in the dermis there. And you can see that here. Okay. Each of these have their own specific functions in terms of detecting deep stimuli. So certainly you'd have to get some pretty deep and firm pressure to activate these bulbous corpuscles. Um, Whereas to activate perhaps this one here, a much lighter pressure is, is uh, needed. And so the free nerve endings near the surface would detect those light touches, whereas the ones deeper in would detect the deeper pressures. Thermal receptors are also found in the dermis, um, found in the skeletal muscle, in the liver, and the hypothalamus. I want to emphasize location for here because the ones in the dermis are going to be measuring environmental heat. Whereas the ones that are deeper, skeletal muscle is going to be measuring heat generated by the muscles as you work out. The liver and the hypothalamus are going to be me measuring core body temperature, which is hugely important when it comes to survival. Your body will try to maintain body temperature uh, to maintain homeostasis, but it focuses on this core. So the temperature of the skin, for example, and even of the skeletal muscles is allowed to change as long as the core remains fairly constant. And so you often will see, for example, as you exercise size, skin temperature actually goes down. Now, why is that? It's because of evaporative cooling. The droplets of water on the skin, as they evaporate, whisk heat away. And that's a good thing for the body because your capillaries are constantly bringing more blood. And so we end up with a heat exchange from the blood to the skin to the atmosphere, drawing heat away. And so the skin becomes cooler relative to the core. And we end up creating a gradient, a temperature gradient, where the core is hotter and the skin cooler and so heat flows from the core through the blood to the skin and is drawn out of the body and this helps maintain homeostasis. Likewise, skeletal muscles heat up during exercise and this has some interesting effects such as causing blood vessels to dilate bringing more blood to the muscles, which is necessary to keep the muscles supplied with oxygen and glucose so that the muscles can do cellular respiration and keep their supplies of ATP high. Nevertheless, because we need to keep the core body temperature while we exercise and generate heat in the muscles, our skin temperature is down and whisking that heat away. And so core body temperature is measured by the hypothalamus in the brain and the liver in the chest. The thermal receptors, the actual proteins, there's no structural difference between them. As I mentioned previously, cold receptors measure the absence of heat, really. So they're both detecting heat energy. Okay. But one response is more sensitive to the absence of heat and the other responds to more heat. Chemoreceptors respond to water-soluble and lipid-soluble substances, and these are found in, in all over the body. There's some in the skin, some in the muscles, some in uh, the blood vessels, some in the hypothalamus, etc. And I've used this example already, but one of the chemoreceptors is osmolarity. And osmolarity of the blood is so important that we even get their, its own name, this, these osmoreceptors, which are a subtype of the chemoreceptors. Um, so we find them in, in numerous places throughout the body. 
One common place that we find chemoreceptors is in the, the brain stem. In the hypothalamus, as being one of those locations, which these actually are going to monitor chemicals called uh, hormones. Okay, and then we also see this in the medulla oblongata, pons, etc. Now, pain has a special name. It's called nociception, the detection of pains. And so nociceptors are pain receptors. Now, these nociceptors usually have free nerve endings, not always. As I mentioned, any chemical stimulus can cause, I'm sorry, any, any type of stimulus, touch, pressure, chemical, etc. can all cause pain. All right. Pain is perceived on two different types of fibers. Type A fibers, specifically type A delta, um, are fast. And they're fast because they are myelinated. Type C fibers are slow because they are unmyelinated. The reason for the two different types of pain is they have different purposes. Fast, re fast pain generally re causes an immediate response. So you're running and you step in a hole and you twist your ankle. Well, if you want to avoid breaking that ankle, you need to immediately shift your weight off the twisted ankle to preserve the tissue and prevent it from being damaged even, even further. Fast pain triggers the reflex that needs to do that. It's an immediate, sharp, very quick uh, sensation. It triggers reflexes and it triggers conscious awareness, although the conscious awareness actually comes uh, a few milliseconds after the reflex response. This is protective. And its purpose is to help you avoid damaging yourself even more. Slow, on the other hand, is this aching, dull, throbbing pain. And it's very, very annoying <laughs> because it's constantly there and it just throbs in the background, sometimes intensely, sometimes less so. But in it becomes your constant companion until you have healed. Slow modifies behavior, or at least ideally modifies behavior. You, of course, can choose to override your natural inclinations. But if you are aching and sore and in pain, you're more likely to rest and recover. And that's the survival advantage that we have because of the slow, aching, dull pain. Unfortunately, this slow, aching, dull pain can often become chronic, which is actually a pretty big problem uh, amongst our, our uh, nation, in our nation. Many, many people suffer from chronic pain. And you may recall me talking about neuroplasticity. Which, if you remember, the more you knew, use the neuronal circuit, in fact, there's a phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. The more you use the neurons, the stronger those circuits can get. So more used equals more efficient. So the circuits become more efficient. And this is usually a good thing. This is how we learn to walk, how we learn physiology, how we learn pretty much everything that makes us amazing and human and fabulous people. Unfortunately, we can also experience synaptic or neuronal plasticity with chronic pain. And so chronic pains can kind of be this unfortunate cycle where chronic pain leads to more chronic pain. And so this is one of the reasons why our health care system has shifted to focus more on pain management. 
It's a quality of life issue, yes. But it also is because chronic pain can lead to even greater health problems down the road. And so it's important to be proactive in managing that pain. And that unfortunately has led us to the current opioid health crisis. So we need better pain management strategies. And so it's actually a hot area of research to figure out how do we better manage these pain, this pain without um, addictive substances? Or when do we need to use these addictive substances? And it's a judgment call. Um, there are times when certainly those opioids are um, necessary and useful uh, for treatment of chronic pain. There's times when perhaps chronic pain can be treated better in a different way or a combination of ways. For example, yoga and hot baths and so forth to treat chronic pain associated with um, muscle aches or joint pain like arthritis. And then on top of that, uh, pain medications, the NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, Aleve, aspirin, the non-NSAIDs, NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, drugs, that's the D, or the non-NSAIDs like Tylenol, um, they can be useful, and then of course the opioids going even a step further. Now I want to talk to you about some vocabulary words that are specific to the immune system that uh, can be a little tricky. <clears throat> but you need to understand them still the same. The term modality refers to the form of energy that activates a sensory receptor. So if I have a chemoreceptor, the modality that activates that chemoreceptor is chemical energy, or in particular this binding energy, which remember we talked about binding as being a chemical reaction. If you have molecule A plus molecule B and they become molecule AB, even if it's just temporary, that's a chemical reaction. If B is my receptor and A is my ligand, we have a chemical reaction. And so it's chemical energy. That's my modality. If I have a receptor that detects heat, then my modality is thermal energy. A receptor that detects light, then my modality are those photons of light or wavelengths of light, and so on and so forth. So it's the form of energy that activates a sensory receptor. Now every receptor specializes, which means they can be act activated by one particular type of energy, let me use thermal. So let's say we need X amount of thermal energy to activate a specific thermal receptor. We would say that this, the thermal receptor is sensitive to that thermal energy. But it is theoretically possible under the right circumstances to activate that thermal receptor with say maybe 10x worth of energy, let's say chemical. So even though the modality that is preferred by the receptor is heat, some receptors can be activated by a different modality. The energy that is that the receptor is most sensitive to, the modality to which the receptor is most sensitive to is referred to the adequate stimulus. So going back to my thermal receptor, thermal energy is the adequate stimulus for my thermal receptor. Nevertheless, sometimes chemical energy can be used. Generally speaking, each receptor is specialized responding to a specific modality. So photoreceptors respond to light. Um, but again, photoreceptors are a good example. 
Light is mo the modality, the adequate stimulus is light, but you can actually use pressure, and you can do this right now. Push your, the palm of your hand with firm pressure against your eye, and you're going to see light. Your eyes closed, there's no light incoming, but you will still see the light, and that's because the pressure is activating those firm photoreceptors. Okay. Now, so the modality, preferred modality or the adequate stimulus for photoreceptor would be light, but other stimuli can activate them. This ability of other stimuli to activate them explains why sometimes we end up getting some really interesting effects. For example, menthol, which is chemical, tricks these thermal receptors into feeling the sensation of cold. Um, capsaicin, which is also chemical, tricks the thermal receptors into feeling like they're hot. If you were actually to use a thermometer, the temperature would not have changed, but the feeling is, or the perception of that energy is that we're detecting heat or cold. Capsaicin is responsible for many of your, well, for all of your peppers that are hot, okay? Menthol is, and eucalyptus does the same thing. These are often found in things that have mint in them. There's a difference between our ability to sense a energy, a type of energy or a modality, and our perception of that energy, okay? Sensation is what happens at the sensory receptor level. And it simply means that the sensory receptor has generated an action potential. We've triggered an action potential. AP for action potential. We might have triggered it with the correct, the adequate stimulus, the correct modality, or we might have triggered it with something else. Menthol triggers action potentials in these thermal receptors. Capsaicin triggers action potentials in these thermal receptors. It simply means that we've, we've activated those sensory neurons. Perception is our conscious awareness of the, of the sensation. It's the interpretation, and it is entirely possible for us to interpret a signal wrong. Again, using menthol as an example, the sensation, what really happens is the sensation was that a chemical activated the receptor. So the chemical stimulus resulted in an action potential in a thermal receptor. And yet the perception, what our brain interprets that signal as, is cold or hot, depending on what the chemical is. Perception can be a lot deeper than the way what I'm describing, too. We often use our own personal biases and understanding uh, to perceive. Case in point, um, I grew up in Colorado in a fairly white neighborhood. And despite my best efforts at avoiding um, racial biases, the reality is my lack of experience with um, other ethnic groups originally, when I first moved to a much more diverse area, allowed me to perceive the area as being less safe. Recognizing this perception as being a false or a biased perception has allowed me to work with my own perceptions to recognize their origin, which was a combination of things, not just the white neighborhood, but the fact that my parents were racist, okay? Um, or at least they had their own racial biases. And so recognizing those as, okay, this is why my brain perceives things the way they do, allowed me to kind of fix those perceptions and to work on those perceptions. And it started first with the recognition of them. Whereas now, you know, now I, I kind of have the opposite perception when I go back home. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never seen so many, you know, l such lack of diversity. What's going on here? I feel like everything's been whitewashed. And it's just a, a just, anyway, 
I'm off topic. But my point is perceptions can be changed and altered too by your own personal experiences, by awareness and by the way you work at things. And so um, <clears throat> to some extent we do have ability anytime we have something conscious to work on our perceptions to some extent. You're still always going to perceive capsaicin as being hot. <laughs> okay. That one we don't have any control over. Even if I'm like, I know this is a chemical. I know it's a chemical. I know it's a chemical. It's still going to be perceived as hot. And I'm still going to have tears running out of my eyes as I eat this delicious and spicy food. Okay. <clears throat> How does our brain decide what it's going to perceive then? Well, there's a number of things that our brain needs to know about any particular sensation. And one of those is the location. Okay. So in order for perception to be accurate, or at least as accurate as possible, we need to know where the sensation is coming from. Okay, where is the sensation coming from? And in this case, with the somatosensory cortex, we're going to rely on um, a, essentially a map that exists within our brain. So if you look over here on the right side, the brain has specific regions of the body that are dedicated or that have real estate in the brain. And that real estate developed or, or the ownership of that real estate was established during early development, embryonic development, development as a young child, etc and becomes kind of permanent. We've, we've, we own the deed for those areas, for example. And that, what that means is that every neuron, so if we have a neuron out here in the tip of my finger, so we're going to draw a little neuron here, okay, and it gets activated by this cut, it's going to send that information through a series of neurons. So the first neuron would be called the primary neuron through a secondary neuron, which is the second one, tertiary neuron, until eventually the information is carried to the brain, specifically to the somatosensory cortex, which you remember that's the area I colored in purple. It's not going to go to just any old region in the somatosensory cortex. It's going to go specifically to the real estate that is dedicated to the index finger and not just the index finger, let's see if I can figure this out. Oh, he's holding up, he or she is holding up the left hand, right? So not just the index finger, but the index finger on the left hand. By the way, I'm going to show you a little bit later in this lecture that uh, sensory information crisscrosses. Most of it crisscrosses in the spine. So the left hand actually sends information to the somatosensory cortex on the right side of the brain. Fun, fun little fact. Evolutionarily speaking, I have no idea why that happens, but it happens in mammals um, and in lower life forms. It's just a thing. So I'm sure there's some reason, but I don't know it. Anyway, so it's going to take that information to the index portion. And because that happens, what ends up happening is action potentials are generated in this segment right here. And our brain, through some marvelous magic we don't quite understand yet, uh, interprets that information and says, Oh, I have a cut on my index finger on my left hand and it hurts. <clears throat> and you can do something about it. So the signal will always go to the same location. So now, you know, you put a Band-Aid on it. And you can feel that band-aid. You feel it because you're lighting up that index region with more signals. All right. <clears throat> always. Okay. This is, this is always true. Although, kind of a fun little bit of information. Um, not so much with somatosensory information, but with some of the, the, uh, special senses, drugs such as LSD can actually cause these pathways to wire incorrectly. So if a specific pathway might go to the optical or the visual cortex and, and tell you you're seeing the color blue, 
so this is normal. With LSD, sometimes it can rewire this, and so it'll tell you that you're seeing the color blue, but there's also a little contralateral branch that's gonna go to the gustatory cortex, maybe, or the auditory cortex, maybe, and tell you that you're tasting the color vanilla. There's a, uh, so LSD will mimic this or will cause this process. Um, there's actually a condition that some people are born with called synesthesia, where this naturally happens during embryonic development or ch early childhood. For whatever reason, um, those neurons didn't get pruned properly. And so, um, and by pruning, I mean you're born with a lot more neurons than you're ever going to use. And so, as you, and as you grow and you develop, what we end up doing is neurons that fire together, wire together. So the ones that we use through through development get stronger. The ones that we don't use, we prune, we get rid of them. And so some of that crisscrossing <clears throat> patterns can exist. Um, the thought process is, is that, you know, people who are autistic often have brains where the pruning process didn't follow typical patterns. So you get these atypical neuronal development. Um, and then people with sensasia, this cool situation where every time, just as an example, every time they see the number two, maybe that number is going to be orange. Or every time they see the number two, maybe they're going to hear a bell ring. Or every time they see two, they're going to taste vanilla. And it's not specific to two, of course. It could be fives or, or A or blue or whatever it is. It's just this crisscrossing of the wiring. <clears throat> Now, one of the ways we locate, localize the stimuli, so we've got this map that exists in our head. We also use something called receptive fields, and um, these receptive fields will <clears throat> help us to pinpoint the location more exactly. Areas that are very, very sensitive, like the tip of your finger, have very small receptive fields, and the res the result is that we actually can pinpoint stimuli very accurately in those sensitive, sensitive areas. And that makes sense because we interact with the world using these fingertips, right? But areas where we do not interact a lot with our environment tend to have very large receptive fields and we cannot pinpoint the location of, of something as easily or as accurately. And you can think of as an example, if I were to try to pick up, let's say I dropped a sewing needle, maybe I'm, I'm mending something and I drop a sewing needle, and I want to find that needle and pick it up, I have to be able to feel it and grasp it. If I'm looking for that needle in the dark, for example, and I'm feeling around for that needle, um, I'm going to use my fingertips because those are most sensitive. Imagine trying to feel for that needle with the back of my hand. Odds are I wouldn't be able to find it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and so what is a receptive field? Well, if you look over here on the right, the receptive field for um, any particular sensory neuron or sensory receptor is the area that is monitored by the dendrites. Whether we have free nerve endings or encapsulated nerve endings, what it means is essentially is if the stimuli, and I'm going to, this blue segment, if the stimuli lands within this particular region, this neuron here that I'm coloring in pink now will detect it. This is the territory that activates the neuron I'm coloring in pink. And so we'll call that receptive field number one. Receptive field number two, I'll color in, my green does not like me. We'll color it in, uh, red's too close to pink. I guess blue works. All right, we'll color it in blue. It's already blue, but I'm gonna color it in even more blue, okay? This is the territory for receptive field number two. And so each neuron has a receptive field. The fields can be large or the fields can be small. <clears throat> now, and the fields also, by the way, can overlap. Let me show you how that looks like. So this is a drawing that I created myself, so please forgive the um, less than professional illustration. But right here we have our receptive field and receptive fields for each different neurons. You'll notice here is my blue 
neuron. And so this would be receptive field number one. But notice also my orange overlaps with that. And so in this area that I'm now coloring in orange, if I had a stimuli that were to land in this spot right here, I would end up activating both the blue neuron, generating an action potential in this blue neuron, and generating an action potential in this orange neuron. For right now, please ignore the red one. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. And so if this information is carried to my brain, um, <clears throat> it might be a little hard to figure out exactly where my stimuli is because both of these neurons are being activated. Same goes with the pink one and the orange one. Now let's talk about that red one. Each of these would be considered the primary neuron, the first neuron in the circuit, the sensory circuit. This neuron here in red is my secondary. And I want you to notice the convergence of these signals onto my secondary neuron. If my secondary neuron is what takes the information onward toward the brain, then my secondary neuron has a receptive field that actually includes all three of these. And so if my stimuli lies in any of those areas, I'm going to get activation of that red neuron. That, and it, so we end up perceiving that as one large receptive field. You can think of this as, you know, your little employees and your district manager. Um, it always is the manager that ends up getting all the credit for the employees, right? Um, and so in this case, even though, you know, employee number one is detecting the stimuli or employee number three is detecting the stimuli, the district manager is what's reporting it. Kind of a silly analogy, but that's the basic idea. So we call primary neurons or first order neurons are the ones that detect the stimuli initially, secondary neurons, second order neurons um, are your district managers. <clears throat> and then you actually can have third order neurons or tertiary neurons as well. Now, using these receptive fields, as I've already mentioned, if the fields are small and there's very little overlap, as shown on the far right, if I were to take a compass with two points and I were to put one point here in this receptive field here, this neuron here is going to be activated one point here in this receptive field here, this neuron here is going to be activated. And notice that there's no convergence. Each of these synapses with its own secondary or second order neuron. And so in that case, the brain will receive two signals. And the brain will be aware that there are two points. That's what we will perceive. This is what we would see in an area that would be highly sensitive. Things like your fingertips, your lips, um, and so forth. Areas like the back of your hand where they're less sensitive or even like the back of your neck where it's less sensitive. Okay, And you don't need to localize the stimuli as much. I can take a two-point compass and notice that they're open to the same distance. Okay, And I put a stimuli right here activating this first primary receptive field. And a stimulation here acting this primary receptive field, activating this neuron that I'm coloring in red and this neuron that I'm coloring in red. But both of those converge onto a second order neuron, and so the brain only perceives one point. Only one point. And so it can be hard to localize that stimuli. The ears are localized a little bit differently. So, by the way, eyes. Um, You're not actually touching the eyes, right? But the light is, the, the photons of light are essentially colliding with the photoreceptors. So it would be kind of the same areas which photoreceptors are being activated in your brain allows you to, I'm sorry, activated in your eyes allows your brain to interpret shape and edges and so forth. Ears are different. We have two ears 
And we're actually, instead of detecting <clears throat> a physical source, we're detecting mechanical energy, yes, because it's, it's sound waves, but we're looking at, at timing. If the stimuli were generated right here in the front, so let's line that up with the nose, so at the very front, the sound waves will each reach each ear at exactly the same time. And so even if your eyes are closed, you know that the sound is coming from the front because of the timing in which this information is carried to the brain. They will reach those auditory centers at the same time. But if the sense is over here, <clears throat> you'll notice that the sound waves are going to reach the ear closest to it first. Only after it reaches the ear closest to it will it reach the second ear. And so based on that information, you can pinpoint the sound from coming from the left, okay, and so forth. And so it's actually about timing. When do the, those ears detect the signal? Now the last thing that falls into this uh, perception category is something called labeled line coding. And this is one that people tend to get confused by. It's a little bit different from this idea of this map in your head. It instead, imagine, if you will, so I'm going to give you kind of a really cheesy imagine, um, uh, thing. So imagine you are in a dark room. You're sitting on a chair. And um, in front of you is a desk and tied to the desk are a number of different strings, okay? And each string, at the other end of the string, somewhere far away where you can't see it, is a person. Okay, so let's, let's think about that. Here, here you are, sitting at your desk, and you have a number of different strings all around you, and this is gonna go to, let's pretend this is Bob. And we'll say this one goes to Sally, and maybe this is gonna go to Fred. Okay? And we're gonna have other, other ones. Your eyes are closed, you can't see anything, but you have these strings and you can touch them. So Bob wiggles his string, generating vibrations. You know that that string belongs to Bob. It's always belonged to Bob. Bob has always held that string. And so any time that Bob wiggles that string, you're gonna be thinking, Bob. Same thing with Sally. Sally wiggles her string. Okay, you're gonna be thinking, oh, that's Sally. Fred wiggles his string, oh, that's Fred. Because you know that's how you set the system up. Sally has one string, Bob has another, Fred has another. Now along comes a cat. Cats are always getting into things. Here's this cat. And the cat's like, oh look, a string. I'm gonna attack that string. So now the cat is wiggling the string. Person in the dark room, eyes closed, doesn't see the cat. All that person knows is the string is being wiggled and that person is gonna assume that Bob did the wiggling. Labeled line coding works like that. Your brain knows that each and every neuron that comes into the brain is assigned a function. Each of them have their modality that they detect. They each have their adequate stimulus. The modality that they're most sensitive to. So anything that wiggles that string will be interpreted as coming from Bob. Or if I am a thermal receptor, interpreted as coming from heat. No matter what, you wiggle that string, your brain's gonna think heat. And that is true even if it's a chemical. We have all sorts of different examples of this. The photoreceptors that I mentioned in your brain. If you press hard enough, normally those photoreceptors are activated by light. So let's do a little 
rod-like structure, forgive the bad art, in a neuron right here. If this neuron gets activated, your brain is going to think light. Even if I'm pressing a fist into my eye and activating it instead of by light, by pressure. And so this is called labeled line coding. More vocabulary. I don't actually know why the sensory nervous system has different names for different things. Um, and don't worry about the fact that I'm using a lobster or a crayfish. I'm not sure what that is. I couldn't find a better picture. I like this picture. Um, but the generator or receptor potential is another and fancy name for an ESP, which is a graded potential. Okay, so I'm sorry we're changing names on you, but a generator percent potential, also known as a receptor potential, is called a graded potential, or is, is the same thing as a graded potential. And graded potentials can be strong or weak based on the stimuli. And you actually know that because we talked about that in um, previously when we were talking about neurons and how they work. If I get a few of those neurotransmitters opened, so a few, I'm sorry, a few ligand gated channels open, I'm going to get this weak stimuli. But if I get more of them open, I'm going to get a bigger stimuli. And so I get my graded potential in this way. With the receptors, the same is true. A strong stimuli will generate a stronger receptor or generator potential. A weak stimuli will generate a weaker receptor stimuli. Okay. What ends up happening after that is quite interesting. And it has to do with the frequency of action potentials. A elevated graded potential so something that looks like, let's say, we're going to, here's my graded potential, my, okay, if I get a really strong signal, even after my ligand gated channels close, it tends to hang out for a while, because it takes a little while for the sodium potassium pump to get rid of my sodium, or restore the balance with calcium, I'm sorry, potassium, and if I have calcium, then it takes a little while for my calcium ATPases to fix things up. Whereas if I get a weak stimuli, when my ligands go away, it's going to fade. Okay? Consequently, the stronger the graded potential, the more action potentials I'm going to reach. Remember with the action potential that we have a uh, refractory period. I can't generate another action potential until that refractory, the absolute refractory period is over. But once it's over, I can generate another one. And so if my graded potential sends a signal and we reach this magic minus 55 millivolts at my trigger zone, we're going to get an action potential. And if that minus 50 millivolts lingers, we'll get another one as soon as the refractory period is over. And as long as we're getting this stimuli that is lingering here, and we could be refreshing that stimuli by continually sending it, we're going to get action potential after action potential after action potential. A strong graded potential or receptor potential or generator potential generates a very high frequency of action potentials. A weak receptor potential generates a very low frequency of action potentials. And your brain uses this information to determine the intensity of a signal. Okay, we actually can use this with touch receptors, for example. So if I imagine a touch receptor, and now I'm going to touch that receptor with um, pretend that's a feather. That doesn't look like a feather at all. Okay, there's my feather. Eh, maybe. Okay. Very light, light touch. What that would probably do is generate in my trigger zone, and then that would be propagated downward, is 
a low frequency stimuli. But then if I take the feather away, and now I'm going to use, well, we'll just go all out, right? This is a hammer, maybe? Okay, pretend with me. Okay, I failed art class. A hammer! Okay, now my uh, stimuli is going to be looking something like this where each action potential is generated as soon as my refractory period is over. Okay, and I get a very high frequency stimuli. We're also going to get activation of pain receptors. Okay, um, and that's important to understand this. This is how the brain interprets intensity. We call this intensity recording or coding. We also use the same method to determine Duration. How does that work? Well, as long as there's a graded potential present, these action potentials will be generated. So let me give you an example. Let's say I have a graded potential that lasts this long. The action potentials generated will last approximately the same length. This length right here is my duration. Now, if I have a graded potential that's the same size, but this time it lasts longer, now my action potentials are gonna last, I'm trying to make this approximately the same frequency, I'm not doing a very good job, but pretend, a little bit longer. So the intensity remains the same, but the duration is different, okay? Um, alternatively, we can have identical durations in intense versus not very intense, which is actually what we have up here. The duration is the same see okay but the frequency is different and that brings us to discussion of tonic versus phasic receptors tonic something that is tonic it comes from the same word as tonus you may know about muscle tone for example and if you think about what muscle tone means, somebody who has a lot of muscle tone means that the muscles are slightly contracted at any given time and are existing in a state of readiness to be contracted. In a tonic sensory receptor, what it means is that the receptor is always generating action potentials. Or, let's add a clarification, almost always. Another way of saying it is it's a slow adapting receptor. A slow adapting receptor. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if we look over here, it means when we apply the stimuli, we're going to get a steady rhythm of action potentials as long as there's a stimuli present. Those action potentials will remain steady until the stimuli withdraws. So here we see this steady rhythm. Now in reality, sometimes that rhythm will change a little bit. Okay, and we might get something like this, where I get my steady rhythm at first. And in some tonic receptors, eventually, that will start to adapt. But not all of them. Some of them work like this, some of them work like this. So they're slow adapting or they don't adapt at all. I should probably define what adapt means. Some receptors, if I have my stimuli, let's say my graded potential, let's diagram it. I guess I'll put the graded potential right here. So if my graded potential looks like this and it lasts a long time, like so, and the axon, it'll generate my action potentials. And if the receptor doesn't adapt at all, the rhythm will remain steady until that graded potential is gone. But in a receptor that does adapt, we'll get a burst of action potentials at the beginning. And then it's going to slow down 
and perhaps even disappear altogether. This is called adaptation. Receptors, also known as receptor desensitization. We see this, some of the common types of receptors that do this are thermal receptors. You've experienced this if you've ever climbed into a hot tub and it's sat at say 104 degrees. At first it's going to sting your skin. It's pretty darn hot. But after you've gotten used to it, what is getting used to it, it, it feels pleasant. You're aware that it's warm and it feels pleasant and nice, but it's no longer stinging your skin. And the reason is your receptors have adapted to it. I told your brain that it was hot but there's really no danger to the hot tub. Well, okay, that's relative. Um, if you're in there for hours and hours, you're going to start causing problems. But short term, no problem. And so the, the receptors desensitize. Your brain got the message. No need to keep shouting, basically. Okay. Tonic receptors don't adapt. <clears throat> And so here you can actually see that for tonic receptors, we get this steady rhythm. Now notice my intensity changes. A graded potential or generated potential that is just above threshold, just above threshold, will give me a low frequency steady beat. A graded potential that is high above threshold will give me a high intensity steady beat. Now what if I'm below threshold? What if my graded potential is just not big enough or my generator potential is just not big enough? Notice I don't have any signal at all. So it's zero. And so you can actually see here, this is a documentation of the stimuli. Here's the length of the stimuli and the size of the stimuli. Now in this case, my duration is the same for each of these examples. Now the opposite of a phasic or a tonic receptor is called a phasic, and these are the ones that do adapt. And they look like this, okay? My graded potential in this case would last my whole, let's see, I'll scribble it in here. So here's my graded potential. It lasts the whole duration. Whoops, sorry, actually it goes like that. Um, but, the intensity of the action potentials or the frequency of the action potentials changes. And so that's important, relevant for a lot of reasons. Important to understand that, um, that we're going to get these changes for these phasic receptors. Now, why do we have these different types of receptors? And again, here we see the generated potentials not strong enough, no signal. Uh, just a little bit above threshold, we get a signal like so. Above threshold by a lot, we get a signal like this. And you can notice that the intensity does change right here, right? Lower frequency versus higher frequency. But then we get a change in the rate of action potential generated, okay? Now, why phasic versus tonic? Well, it has to do with their purpose. Phasic tends to be about communicating information to the brain or the spinal cord that we need to know. But once we know it and we make a decision, once it's integrated, once it's perceived, once we've decided how to react to that decision, um, there's no need to keep sending that information. The hot tub example is a great example. You get in and you're sensory nervous system sends a message to the brain and your brain thinks, oh, this is really hot. But you've also learned through use, maybe you've had a hot tub forever or you've gotten in lots of hot tubs, you're, you know that it's going to feel really good. So you get in anyway. Um, and so there's no need for your brain to keep thinking hot, 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 hot. The hot tub's not going to burn you. It's not going to hurt you. And so uh, it turns off the information. Another example is your clothes. When you first put your clothes on, you actually feel them. But once you, as you're going about your day, can you imagine how annoying it is if every time you move, your brain's like, oh, my pants are brushing my leg. Every time, you know, you shift positions, oh my gosh, my shirt bunched up right there. 
how annoying that would be. So those receptors are phasic. They tell your brain at first, hey, I just put a shirt on, I'm not naked. Um, but they don't continue to send the information. Tonic receptors, on the other hand, and this is very important to remember, okay? It's a possible exam question. Very important. Tonic receptors are about maintaining homeostasis or avoiding inner injury um, or compensation of some sort. And therefore, they constantly send the information or they send the information uh, and they adapt very, very slowly because we need constant information to the brain. Some great examples of some tonic receptors. Blood pressure. At any given time, your brain stem is receiving information about blood pressure. When your blood pressure is low, so let me show you how that's going to work. So when your blood pressure is low, you get a low frequency stimuli. When your blood pressure is elevated, you get a high frequency stimuli. And at any given time, you're always, always, always sending information to the brain unless your blood pressure drops really, really low, at which point this is what's going to happen. It's just basically crickets. And that's when you're really, really in danger. You, you're, you're screwed, basically. You need some medical help. Uh, actually, you should have gotten medical help long before you reached that point. Osmolarity, constant signals. High, uh, blood pH, constant signals. These are all tonic receptors. Okay. Um, even heat. This is very interesting. Even heat. So as long as we're in safe ranges, we're not going to get burned. Okay. Our thermal receptors are phasic. But when we exit out of those safe ranges, either too cold or too hot, and we're at risk of injury, these become tonic. Okay? You're not going to get used to boiling water. You're not. At least not until your skin dies and those neurons die. Um, you just don't get used to it. It's painful. And it becomes pain. Some good examples of some tonic receptors versus phasic receptors can actually be found in the skin. Going back to those different examples of receptors that you see, um, receptors that are responsible for light touch, such as the touch of your clothes on your skin, send information only when you put the clothes on or you touch with a feather and then when you take the clothes off. So the beginning and the end is all it does. And in between, we're not really sending any kind of signals to the brain. Same thing with touch, uh, light touch, some vibrations. As we start to press deeper, though, notice this. We start to adapt more slowly. The, the more significant the stimuli and the more at risk you are of causing damage, the less those receptors adapt. Pinching, for example, or stretching, that hurts because you could potentially damage the tissue, right? You can bruise it. You can, you can draw blood if you pinch hard enough, especially with your nails. Um, <clears throat> and then things that are extremely uh, likely to damage the tissue, such as being struck with a hammer, these don't adapt at all. So these would be, not only are they slow adapting, they don't adapt, okay? You're, you're sending signal that says, this hurts, this is bad, right? <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned earlier that um, the sensory neurons tend to crisscross in the spinal cord. The this particular figure is actually to show you how that essentially works. Um, approximately, if I remember correctly, about 90% of all the sensory nervous systems are going to cross over to the other side so that your any sensation on your left side is perceived by your right brain. So left sensations. perceived by the right 
brain. Okay? And vice versa. Well, sensations from the right will be perceived by the left. The crossover occurs at different places. Many of the cross, a lot of the neurons will cross over in the medulla oblongata, specifically in a region um, of the medulla oblongata called the desiccation of the medial laminxcus or also desiccation of the pyramids. And because pyramids are easier to pronounce, that's the one you need to watch for on my on the exam. Easier to pronounce, easier to 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 uh, spell. So uh, I will tend to use just the word pyramids, but it's located in the medulla oblongata, and it's the region where, if we were to track these these neurons, proprioception, mechanoreception, etc., branches of this travel up to the medulla oblongata in through the dorsal root ganglia, whoops, don't be, in through the dorsal root ganglia, and then up to the thalamus, and then to the primary somatosensory cortex. <clears throat> so these are the common pathways for a vast majority of the sensory information. Nociception, and I'm sure some of the others, will do it a little bit differently, where nociception takes the information to a level of the spinal cord that is responsible for receiving information from whatever area is being hurt. And in that area, it will actually then send the information over, crossing over and up, and we follow the same process. Okay, so these sensory tracks, um, just being aware of them, can be used, by the way, to determine where a spinal injury might occur, for example. So if you imagine in your hand, let's say you lose the sensation of touch. Um, you can perhaps determine based on uh, where the problem is, where the uh, injury in the spinal cord might have occurred. Testing reflexes help you understand the same thing. And that brings us to the reflex arc. What arc? What is a reflex? Well, a reflex always involves an efferent neuron. So the efferent pathway right here, taking the information into the brain. So that's the sensory nervous system that we've been talking about this whole time. And it involves primary neurons, secondary neurons, tertiary neurons, and everything else that we just talked about carries the information to the central nervous system. Now for a spinal, for a reflex to be exactly that, a reflex to occur without having to consciously think about it. It's an automatic process. Um, this has to happen before we perceive anything consciously. Now that's not to say that conscious perception doesn't happen, but usually we act upon the information before we perceive it. Okay. And we all do this. You touch a hot stove, uh, you usually will move your hand before you even know whether you've been burned. Um, we do this all the time. You know, it's, it's a natural instinct. As, you know, we touch something hot, immediately we're moving our hand. We know it's hot, we're moving our hand, um, acting before we even know whether it hurts or not. Um, a lot of those occur when the sensory information feeds into the spinal cord. So a large number of reflex pathways involve the spinal cord or brainstem. Okay. Those are common um, integrating centers or processing centers for these reflex pathways. Then the central nervous system is going to decide, usually the brain stem is going to, or the spinal cord going to decide what to do. And it really depends at this point what the sensory information is telling the spinal cord or the brain stem. If it's about touching a hot pan and moving your arm, then that central processing unit is going to activate 
the motor pathway for the skeletal muscles. In other words, your voluntary process, so skeletal muscles. And this is voluntary. If, however, the reflex is, for example, osmoreflex, the osmolarity reflex. If you bl measure blood osmolarity and it's too high, you need more water in your blood. And so the reflex for that would be to regulate the kidneys to retain more water and behavioral processes in the brain to make you thirsty. And so those are going to be involuntary processes. And instead of using the motor neurons for the skeletal muscle, it's going to use the motor neurons. It's the autonomic nervous system. So this one's the somatic motor neurons. The other one's the autonomic motor neurons. Most people forget that autonomic has motor in the name as well. And that's partly laziness. Even I will just call it the autonomic nervous system instead of the autonomic motor nervous system. Each reflex arc has then five steps. First, we need to detect the stimuli. Second, we need to generate action potentials on the afferent neuron or neurons. Remember, because we can have primary, secondary, tertiary neurons. Okay. The information is then processed by the central nervous system and then efferent neuro neurons transmit neuron or neurons again, transmit the action potentials to the effector and the effector responds. What are the effectors? Well, skeletal muscle if we're dealing with the voluntary process and if we're dealing with involuntary processes, it's glands, smooth muscle um, or other such tissues as shown here. This diagram is a nice diagram that it identifies for us the effector organs, smooth muscle, glands, and cardiac muscle. That was the third one that I was missing by the autonomic nervous system. Okay. And so um, different functions, different results based on the sensory information that is being perceived. For example, blood pressure, you would get the reflex change in blood vessel diameter. Um, low osmolarity, a reflex change in uh, hormone release. Heart rate too low, a reflex change in cardiac contraction rates. All generated and regulated by the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> now let's talk specific types of reflexes. And I'm going to teach you first about the most simple, which is the monosynaptic reflex. The monosynaptic reflex involves a, a sensory neuron or sensory neuronal circuit. Um, and actually because it's just one monosynaptic, one sensory neuron and one efferent neuron. And the synapse, the single synapse that forms between the two of them is found in the spinal cord. <coughs> the sensory neuron carries the information in through the dorsal root ganglion into the spinal cord and then the there's the synapse and the information for the motor neuron whether it's autonomic or skeletal carries the information out of the ventral horn okay remember this is my ventral horn region and my dorsal root ganglion um, is the uh, superior or actually it's not really superior in this part um dorsal okay part there um and that's the basic process there one of the great examples of a monosynaptic reflex is the patellar reflex now we're going to learn that there's a little bit more complexity to this than i am showing here on this particular slide but in the patellar reflex in the skeletal muscles you have um, a lovely spindle, which is the sensory receptor. And it is activated by compression. So as the muscle fibers stretch, that spindle will be, muscle spindle will be compressed and that will activate the neuron that is, um, that is part of that apparatus. 
when you strike the patellar tendon, it actually causes the quadricep muscles to stretch just a tiny bit. And the reflex that it then triggers is for those muscles to contract. So the compression of the muscle spindle or the neuromuscular spindle, whichever you prefer to call it, generates an action potential in that sensory neuron, which is propagated down the axon into the dorsal root ganglion and triggers the release of neurotransmitter right here at this synapse. That neurotransmitter will then activate the motor neuron, which sends the information, again, generating an action potential, which propagates down the synapse until it reaches the muscle fibers. Found in the quadricep muscles and that's going to cause these muscle fibers to shorten and that then cause quadricep contraction. It's a fairly simple process, this monosynaptic synapse. Monosynaptic synapses um, are common reflexes, but there's usually, in addition to the monosynaptic uh, synapses, some additional information or additional events that occur. The monosynaptic synapse is this one right here that I'm circling in blue. But sensory neurons can branch. Sensory neurons branch. So in this particular case, this particular sensory neuron has its main branch right here. But then it also has this contralateral branch that I'm showing you right there. Not shown would be a third branch that would potentially carry the information up toward the brain in ascending track. And I drew that outside the spinal cord. Really, it would be inside the spinal cord. Um, that ascending track would be contained within the spinal cord. The branch of the nervous of the sensory neuron can form a synapse with a different type of neuron. Shown right here in red, and I'm going to just kind of color on top of it so you can see it a little better, is a small neuron called an interneuron. Now, interneurons are special because they are found only in the central nervous system. They can be inhibitory or they can be excitatory. And they act as relay stations to carry information and coordinate information between different um, different neurons. And in this particular case, this inhibitory interneuron is going to synapse onto, we'll do it in purple, this neuron right here. And this neuron right here feeds, or we say innervates, you want to be comfortable with that term, to supply with nerve endings is what innervates means. It synapses with muscles in the hamstring. If you're going to inhibit, so right here at this 4B region, you would be generating IPSP. If you're going to inhibit that muscle, then you're going to make sure that hamstring muscle does not contract. So it will relax instead. This is going to happen at the exact same time that the neuron here in this monosynapse labeled in this picture as three is going to generate an action potential and cause the hamstring or the quadriceps to contract. Quadriceps and hamstrings are antagonistic or reciprocal muscles. Usually if I'm lifting my leg, if I'm uh, it, flexors and extensors would be what you'd call them in anatomy. And so if I'm contracting my quadricep, I want to make sure my hamstring is going to relax. If both of them contract at the same time, my leg becomes stiff and does not move. Okay, and that's kind of an important thing to understand. And so with this reciprocal inhibition, we have this nifty process where the, the we have our monosynaptic reflex, and to make sure you really understand that, I'm going to highlight the whole darn thing in yellow, I guess. 
This is my monosynaptic reflex involving the afferent neuron and the efferent neuron and a single synapse between them. <clears throat> but monosynaptic reflexes are usually usually work side by side with the um, reciprocal inhibition process. And so they occur simultaneously to one another. Technically speaking, reciprocal inhibition is a polysynaptic reflex, which involves activating more than one neuron, more than one synapse. This video here is a lovely video on reflexes just in general. You could watch the whole thing and definitely be benefited by it. This individual, Armando, and I, forgive me, Hasun Dagen, I probably butchered his last name, um, is an amazing artist and gives amazing instructional videos. Um, he's a fabulous resource. And um, if you watch the whole video, you won't regret it. But if you want to watch just about polysynaptic reflexes, you can start at about 7.07 or 7.08 is I believe when he starts talking about it. In this video, I'm not going to show you that video. Instead, we're just going to move on to talk about it. And here I essentially reference <clears throat> some of the stuff that is talked about in the previous video. But a polysynaptic reflex is important because it can cause a more complicated response. Instead of having just one synapse like the monosynaptic, it will have several synapses, sometimes hundreds of synapses involved. And it usually involves um, carrying information to other segments of the spinal cord, um, often involves reciprocal inhibition and uses these inhib interneurons, which are both excitatory, which can be either excitatory or inhibitory. They are one or the other, never both. It's just not possible for a neuron to be both. Um, in fact, this is true just across the board. If a neuron releases the uh, neurotransmitter acetylcholine, that's it. That's the only neurotransmitter it's going to release. Um, if a neuron releases, I mean, you can't make it start releasing GABA. It's just not going to happen. Every synapse from that particular neuron will release acetylcholine. And so we would uh, call that a cholinergic neuron because it releases only acetylcholine. Likewise, with a glutamatergic neuron, it releases only glutamate. Um, actually, that one's a little different. It'll release some uh, glycine too. But in general, they release only specific neurotransmitters. And so we tend to name those neurons after the transmitter that they release. Serot serotonergic releases, uh, neurons release serotonin. Dopaminergic releases dopamine. Gabinergic, that one's a little mouthful, releases GABA, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, so you can have excitatory inhibitory interneurons. We'll look at the ref withdrawal reflex. Now, this is a little different from the um, patellar reflex, although you can get a re withdrawal reflex using the patellar reflex. But this one, we're going to do a different one. You have withdrawal reflexes in the arms when you touch a hot stove. That's a withdrawal reflex. Um, and in this case, we're going to use the leg. When you step on something or you hurt, twist your ankle, you're going to immediately withdraw and put your weight on your other foot. So if we look at this reflex, what we're going to notice here is um, I want to notice this is actually somewhat simple. We'll add some complexity to it in a minute. Notice my interneuron. Let's color it a little brighter. So we're going to show you my interneuron right here. Okay. And Actually, let me change the color. I'm going to change it. Remember, previously we used green means go, so I'm going to go ahead and change it to green because in this case it's an excitatory neuron. Green means go. My sensory neuron, we'll diagram that, we'll keep stick with my standard, is, is in pink here. And when you step on something like a tack or a nail or you twist your ankle, you're going to get ac activation of that sensory neuron. It will carry the information through the dorsal root, root ganglion and then we're going to form a synapse with that interneuron. Now incidentally there are some branches too that are going to be carrying the information up to um, higher or, or uh, more superior regions of the spinal cord. 
we'll come back to that. For right now, notice that we have one of the synapses in here. So this is synapse here, and I'll just label it for now as synapse 1. <clears throat> now the interneuron synapses onto the motor neuron, and we'll just call that synapse 2. And that one we'll just kind of color in black, and you can see that the motor neuron is going to affect the hamstring, which would essentially cause you to um, kick back, so withdraw your leg, right? <clears throat> um, and so we're going to get this withdrawal process using more than one uh, of the synapses. And so here we walk through it step by step. It starts with no susception of pain. The afferent neuron is as activated, which synapses onto the excitatory interneuron. And that's important to remember that it's excitatory. Green means go. And it comes to a specific segment of the spinal cord. <clears throat> and then we're going to end up with the interneuron relaying the information to the efferent neuron. And the efferent neuron stimulating the, st the hamstring to correct contract, which causes you essentially to pull your leg back, okay, um, to flex your leg, right? Now, meanwhile, we're going to want that quadricep to relax. So here I did a kind of a very bad drawing, and to be qu completely honest, I'm basically trying to copy what Armando did, but he is incredible, and I'm not so much. So um, I'm trying, I tried to do a screen capture because that would have been better, but I couldn't do the screen capture, so I tried to draw it. Anyway, forgive the bad art. Remember how I said that there is branches? Let's look right here. Okay, and this time I did it in blue. Sorry, I didn't stick with my color scheme. Here's my afferent neuron. It's my nociception. Carries the information into the dorsal root ganglion, synapses with my yeah synapses with my um interneuron activates that interneuron but it also is going to branch and one of the branches goes from one level of the spinal cord to the next level above superior of it where again it's going to synapse now i have it drawn as if it were coming in through the dorsal root ganglion the reality is it wouldn't do that it would actually go up through ascending tracks in the spinal cord. So it's not going to exit the dorsal root ganglion and go back in the dorsal root ganglion. I just couldn't draw it as beautifully as Armando does. So understand that it's going up through some ascending tracks. And in the next level up, it's going to synapse onto, it's going to branch again. And this time it's going to synapse onto two different neurons. One of them is green and it's therefore excitatory. And the excitatory is going to activate the hamstring. And notice we've got a partnership here. We have the hamstring being activated first by the bottom level. So you can kind of see me scribbling in here. Okay. And then we're going to have the hamstring activated by the level above it. Well, the hamstring is, hamstrings, I should say, are multiple muscles and have multiple muscle fibers and so it would make sense that you would use more than one neuron to activate those muscle fibers to generate the withdrawal reflex where you kick your you essentially flex at the knee joint <clears throat> but in addition to this we also get the activation of the inhibitory pathway where you can see and I'll make it bigger and, and more easy to see this lovely red interneuron here and in this case red means stop so this is going to generate an IPSP onto my purple neuron which is my effector I mean my uh, uh, efferent neuron and that purple neuron happens to form a synapse with the muscle fibers found in the quadriceps and so if I inhibit my purple neuron, then I inhibit contraction in my quadriceps, causing them to relax. And so here you can see how we use multiple levels of the spinal cord <clears throat> to control this withdrawal reflex. If that didn't make any sense, go watch the beautiful video. Okay. Now, 
we're getting close to the end. One thing I want to talk about is that we do have the ability to suppress reflexes used in our central nervous system. And we do this all the time. But it often takes training and conditioning to be able to do this well. Um, the example I'm, I'm using here is that we often choose to suppress the withdrawal reflex. Usually if we get poked with something sharp, we're going to move away from it. But if we're receiving a vaccination or somebody's drawing blood or maybe we're pricking our finger to do a, a test on blood glucose, um, we have the ability to suppress that reflex. So I'm not jerking my finger away. It takes training though. You have to learn how to do it right. Um, and so we learn how to suppress that reflex and it comes with anticipation. We know that we're going to get poked. So we are going to choose to modulate the reflex. And so we send information down. Um, I'm actually going to go back up here and kind of illustrate that, um, on this particular slide. We send information from our central nervous system and we essentially will activate those inhibitory, uh, interneurons using descending pathways from the central nervous system. Our thalamus is often involved in this, especially when it involves pain. Okay. And so we essentially just prevent uh, the neurons from contracting. I'm sorry, prevent the neurons, the effector neurons from being excited. <sighs> We do this, you know, the example of the withdrawal reflex, but also if you think about the reflex to urinate or defecate, both of those are reflexes. And as infants, when our bladder was full, we urinated. It didn't really matter where we were or what we were doing. It, we just emptied our bladder. Same thing with defecation. When the rectum became full with feces, we would empty our, um, our rectum. And we didn't exercise any control over that. That was just a reflex. But through training, we learned how to suppress those processes using our central nervous system. So when the sensory nerve neuron says, so let's kind of draw, pretend like not very good bladder, but this is my bladder. When the sensory neurons that are in the bladder wall goes to the spinal cord. And essentially says, Hey, I'm full. That information is carried to the brain and the brain sends information back saying not now's not really a good time. And through an inhibitory interneuron suppresses the neuron that would cause those smooth muscle contractions necessary for voiding of the bladder. A little bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea there. So we constantly are using the central nervous system to modulate our reflex. Another example of this mod modulation process is with pain when we are in danger. So I give the example of you step and you twist your ankle and you shift your weight to the other side and probably stop. Let's say you're running, you stop running. Okay. You, you take a second and maybe you're going to stumble a little bit, but you stop. And if your ankle hurts too bad, you're done running for the day. You're going to go back home and you're going to ice it and you're going to take care of it and baby it for a little while until it gets better. But what if you're not out for a nice jog, you're running from a grizzly bear and you step and you twist your ankle. Are you going to stop and baby it? Of course not. You better keep running. And so your thalamus can actually suppress pain so that you can keep running. And this happens. People talk all the time about, you've heard this, like you get in a car crash and your uh, adrenaline, which is another name for epinephrine levels are high. And you don't realize that you're gushing blood because you're so excited by this, this situation, this car accident, um, things like that happen on a fairly regular basis. We do suppress pain when we're in emergency situations or just an overly excited situation. My husband is into um, this mixed martial arts fighting thing and I think it's just too gruesome. But anyway, he was talking about a, a fight several, probably several years ago by now, where somebody broke his toe and it was like just kind of flapping around and 
he'd like for me i'd be like screaming in agony and on the floor and this person just kept fighting um which brings me to a concept that's really not about reflexes but since it is about the sensory nervous system i wanted to talk about it um and this is an idea of, of gate theory uh for pain perception and it factors into this idea of chronic pain that i was talking about earlier managing chronic pain and looking for other strategies to treat chronic pain. Now this is a little bit difficult to understand, so let me kind of walk you through that process. This is not the best figure. I don't love it so much, but it is going to have to do. <clears throat> All right, we're actually going to start with the bottom, okay, and then move up. So in the spinal cord, so this region right here is going to be in my spinal cord. That's important to understand. Actually, let me change that figure because it would actually involve all of this. Okay. In the spinal cord, you have a ascending track. And that's this neuron. We'll color it in blue. This is an ascending track. And this tells your brain that you have pain. Okay. That's your tract that tells you that there's pain. And it will travel through the spinal cord up into the uh, brain. And you will consciously perceive that pain. Also in the spinal cord, you have A fibers, okay? They're not the same A fibers as, as pain fibers, but you have those A fibers that are constantly sending information about non-painful stimuli. This could be proprioception. This could be, you know, something like your clothes, could be somebody rubbing your shoulders. And that non-painful stimuli course information is carried through ascending fibers toward the brain but it also a branch of that neuron synapses onto a interneuron so interneuron that is inhibitory which means it releases a neurotransmitter that inhibits the, the action potentials generated in um, the ascending tract. We're gonna, this one here. So as long as that inhibitory neuron, this guy here is being activated by these non-painful stimuli, it's dumping neurotransmitter onto the ascending pain neuron, the pain pathway. And that neurotransmitter is inhibitory, so it's going to s prevent no... It's going to reduce the signal, okay? It's going to cause no pain signal. So let's put pain in here, pain. And so your brain is not going to perceive pain. It's going to be like, oh, I'm fine, I'm good, okay? And that's happening all the time. Constantly, constantly, we're getting information from our environment and that is suppressing the signal of pain. It's essentially kind of saying like, everything's good, everything's fine. But then you have your pain fibers. Now, right here, it's gonna show you the C fiber, which remember that's responsible for chronic pain. But you'll have something simpler, similar with acute pain, although the chronic pain is probably the best one. Now, notice that my signal for pain also forms a synapse with my pain fiber and notice that this is going to generate an EPSP. So we've got a direct synapse onto that ascending pain pathway and that will activate the ascending pain pathway. At the same time, it, a branch will inhibit okay, the um, inhibitory neuron. So by inhibiting the inhibitory neuron, we're removing that inhibitory signal. And so then we would end up generating pain. So walking up here, we actually break it down into little tiny bits at a time where we look at these fibers, okay? And by the way, a fiber, is it's a nerve, so it's a bundle of neurons. So even though this is shown as a branch here showing positive and a branch here, this would actually have to be two different neurons because you can't have something that can both inhibit and activate. Nevertheless, the idea is the same, that 
normal conditions, normal is what's here on the top, we get constant inhibition of these ascending pathways. And so we don't have any signal going to the brain. No pain signal, and so your brain doesn't perceive pain. No pain. Okay, that's constant. That's the normal. Throw in the nox nauseous symbol, and now we, uh, we call it closing the gate. We stop the inhibitory neuron from signaling, and at the same time activate the pain receptors, or the pain ascending pain pathway, and now we perceive pain. And then throw in, let me erase some of the noise so I can walk you through this kind of more slowly again. Then when you combine that with touch, um, the touch will actually help to reduce that pain. And so this is one example of a therapy that can be used to help reduce pain that doesn't involve drugs through touch. Uh, this could be massage, this could be acupuncture, perhaps. Um, but this process of activating these fibers to help relieve pain, just one example of a way to use an alternative strategy. Now, I also want to teach you this because of something very interesting, and that is spinal cord, or that is injury that re involves amputation. If you amputate a limb, you're removing this. And that essentially leaves you with only <clears throat> uh, this inhibitory neuron that is neither receiving a negative stimulus nor a positive stimulus. And in the absence of stimulus, that inhibitory neuron basically stops. So there's no stimulus. There's nothing generating graded potentials in that neuron. And so inhibition stops. And consequently, that leaves this to signal the brain. Remember, this is in the spinal cord, so this would not be affected by that amputation. And so the end result is even though the limb is gone, you end up with phantom pain, phantom limb syndrome. Um, the perception that the limb is causing, it's either itching or it's painful or something to that effect. Now, some therapy strategies can help reduce this, and that's actually going to use the central nervous system to start inhibiting here. But that takes training and some cool things you can do with marriage, which I can talk to you about at another time, um, <clears throat> where it essentially teaches your central nervous system to start inhibiting that pathway. But this is the basic idea or the basic theory as to why phantom pain actually even happens. And I think that's pretty cool. So anyway, there you go. Uh, and that's it for today or for this particular lecture. Uh, have a fabulous day.